Okay, thank you for joining everybody. Um, I'm Bob Boyle, I'm a, a reader at um, Imperial. I've been a paediatric allergist for the past um, uh, 20 years uh, with an interest in allergy prevention. Um, I'm going to talk about um, cow's milk allergy. Um, and uh, when I suggested this as a topic, Andy um, Bush was sort of, really? And, and I think I would have had the same reaction about five, ten years ago. I thought, well, this is a bit tedious. It's like talking about Ticarcillin allergy or something for an hour. Um, um, but I think you'll see, uh, those of you who, who've tuned in, um, to um, I think you'll see that this cosmic allergy and, and the, the issues around it have relevance across child health um, and messages for all of us working with uh, children and uh, particularly infants and preschool children. Um, so what I'm going to do for this um, presentation is essentially present a series of um, seven or eight questions for, for uh, those of you who tuned in. Um, and uh, I'm not going to sort of directly tell you the answers, but I'm going to do a poll and then um, present a little bit of information after each question, uh, which uh, illustrates you know, um, uh, the issues and, and you know, come to your own conclusions. So first question, really to give it a bit of context, is the wider issue of food allergy, um, uh, which of course milk allergy is part of. Um, and the question here is, um, is food allergy becoming more common? So I'd like you to vote. I'm Nicola's just going to do a poll. Um, on whether you think food allergy is uh, becoming more common or has become more common in the last uh, uh, um, decade or two uh, in um, places like London, um, uh, countries like the UK. <clears throat> I'll just give you a few seconds till everyone's voted there. Okay, so we can probably um, show the results there. I think that's fairly clear and pretty much as expected. Um, uh, you can see that most people have said uh, food allergy is becoming more common and that's certainly the sort of narrative um, that um, the public also uh, adhere to. So I'm just gonna want to question that and what I want to do is introduce the concept of, um, if I can, it's difficult to move the slide. Yeah, um, I just want to introduce the concept of um, overdiagnosis, and this is something which is uh, you know widely accepted issue across healthcare, um, with all the major journals and, and medical institutions sort of um, uh, recognizing it. And BMJ particularly having sort of driven a lot of the noise and conversation around overdiagnosis. So overdiagnosis is when um, patients acquire diagnostic labels or are put through tests or are given treatments um, that are not necessary. And um, there are various drivers behind that, but it's quite a common issue across healthcare, uh, including paediatrics. And, and um, um, I, to give an example, the sort of typical pattern of overdiagnosis, this is a classic one, which is thyroid cancer. So here on the, the green line, you'll see cases of thyroid cancer, uh, rates per 100,000 of the population, um, uh, shooting up in the 1990s, so an apparent epidemic of thyroid cancer. Um, uh, and the red dotted line at the bottom there is deaths from thyroid cancer not changing at all. It's a very typical pattern and what, what drove this was not an increase in thyroid cancer but changes in diagnostic um, and modalities and people picking up um, sort of pre-malignant or, or, or mild forms of thyroid cancer that weren't going to progress so, um, leading to an apparent uh, epidemic there. So that's a sort of typical pattern of overdiagnosis and I'd like to suggest that that is probably happening with food allergy. So food allergy, you see this same sort of pattern of softer indicators of the prevalence of the disease shooting up. So uh, EpiPen prescriptions, uh, we've got about three or four times as many as we had in 2004 in, the, in, the, in circulation. Um, hospital admissions for anaphylaxis in young children shooting up in Australia, US, uh, UK. And some recent data here um, uh, from BBC um, showing number of children admitted with severe allergic reactions. Again, that's largely food allergy going up. Um, but again, what you see with overdiagnosis is you see the hard indicators not changing. So the biologic markers or fatality rates not shifting. And we see that with food allergy, that um, uh, rates of fatal food anaphylaxis are absolutely static in this country. And there are similar data from uh, US and Australia um, not showing a, uh, a clear increase in, in fatalities there. Um, and again, um, objective markers of allergic sensitization to foods <clears throat> don't seem to be changing. These are the best data we've got there, really, which are from um, two um, uh, similar cohorts in 
uh, Melbourne, Australia um, in 1994 and 2011. Um, showing that allergic sensitization to egg, peanut or milk with three commonest uh, food allergens doesn't seem to have shifted there at all. And a similar if you go to the UK, and we're going to hone in a little bit on milk allergy now because milk allergy is the topic. So um, in the Isle of Wight studies uh, in the UK, which are the best allergy cohort studies here, 1% um, sensitized to milk uh, in 1989, half a percent in 2001. In the US, NHANES studies, again, very good epidemiology there, about half a percent of children sensitized to milk in 1994 and 2006. So I'd like to question really, first of all, uh, as a bit of background, whether food allergy really is uh, increasing or whether we just are more aware of it and are more concerned about it and, and managing it in a more, more proactive way so that you get more cases on your books. Um, for milk allergy, the best um, epidemiology is the Europe Aval study of nine uh, um, European countries, a birth cohort of over 12,000 uh, infants. And they looked at IgE-mediated milk allergy, non-IgE-mediated allergy, milk allergy, the sort of delayed type. And overall, the prevalence of milk allergy is around about 1% or perhaps a little bit below that um, in, uh, in European countries. A little bit of variation, but not more than 1.3% in any of the uh, individual countries there. Um, so, and that, there's no sort of reason to think that that might have changed really in the last uh, 20 years. So my second question for you is, um, what proportion of infants uh, whose parents say their child's got milk allergy uh, have the condition? Would it be most of them, 80 to 90 percent? Uh, would it be more like a 50-50 situation, um, uh, as with many allergic conditions, or would it be more like um, uh, the minority of uh, uh, infants whose parents think their child has milk allergy uh, have the condition? And um, <clears throat> thank you for, uh, we'll just give it couple of seconds for a few more votes to come in and I think we can share that there's a fairly clear pattern there so thanks Nicola so um uh thank you for your very clear response there that the minority so there's a perception there obviously amongst you guys that um, most um children whose parents think they've got milk allergy um don't have milk allergy and I think that's correct um what um <clears throat> what we see uh, we just did a, um, this is a clinical trial population, but it's community-based population of 1,400 um, mothers and infants, um, and then there are infants around uh, England uh, in the BEEP trial. Um, so this is sort of the most recent kind of uh, good-sized UK study on this issue. And here we saw that about 14% of parents uh, reported that their child had a cow's milk allergy, and most of them saying it was an immediate type milk allergy. And of those, only 10%, uh, so 1.4% of the whole population, could be confirmed as having milk allergy. So it's about, um, based on the BEEP study, about um, uh, 10 to 1. So for every 10 um, parents who are saying their child had milk allergy, we could identify one who had a uh, you know, challenge proven um, milk allergy. Um, and you see a similar pattern when you look at um, prescriptions of low allergy formulas. So this is sort of specialized formula milks, which are given to um, formula fed infants with um, milk allergy. Um, and you'll see that um, the English uh, database, the uh, community prescriptions for these specialized formulas um, are, have um, shot up in the last 10 years. So uh, there's a lot of prescription of these formula milks in terms of total volume uh, uh, prescribed in the UK. And some might say, oh, well, maybe everyone was missing milk allergy before and now that's been corrected and we've got a good prescription rates, but if you put that 1% prevalence of milk allergy onto the population, you can work and you look at um, uh, formula use rates in the population, you can calculate the volume of uh, specialized formula milks that should be being used in the UK, in, in, in England um, uh, if every case of milk allergy is, is picked up immediately and all the formula fed ones are given specialized formula milks until they're a year old. And that's what it should look like. So again, we've got a, a pattern really of about the tenfold overuse of specialized formula milks compared to what you might expect um, where they just use when they're necessary. Um, so I think you're all right on that that question that um, the majority of um, patients with uh, young infants who are thought to have milk allergy uh, don't have the condition. Um, question three. So who might benefit from milk allergy overdiagnosis? And here I want to really refer to the overdiagnosis literature in general. So who what are the drivers for overdiagnosis? It's, it's there in all sorts of um, health conditions. You know, we've seen it maybe in 
I don't know, ADHD in pediatrics or in, in there are various um, health conditions where there's been a sort of apparent boom in diagnosis. What's driving that? Uh, what does the literature tell us in terms of the um, uh, incentives which lead to this unfortunate situation where, where you know, diagnostic labels are in, imposed upon people who don't really need them? and sometimes uh, uh, risky treatments. So um, is it just companies? Is it all the, the big bad industries um, and their, their shareholders are trying to make money? Uh, are healthcare professionals part of the problem or part of the solution or a bit of both? Um, and what about patients and patients adver patient advocacy groups? Are they uh, protecting their patients against these sorts of influences or are they um, uh, also part of the problem? Um, so I think that's great. We can end the polling there. Um, some uncertainty, I think it's fair to say, about what's driving this. So um, essentially the, um, the overdiagnosis literature um, tells us that uh, it's, it's, you know, the, it's mostly around drugs, most of the overdiagnosis literature, but diagnostic tests are relevant, um, specialised um, milks, as we've seen here, it's, a, it's another uh, relevant issue. EpiPens, I think, probably the, you know, the drivers around there. So, I mean, money is the main driver. Um, and um, that obviously the people who make tests and treatments are, are those who profit most from overdiagnosis or, or over treatment. Um, but um, the history tells us that the healthcare professionals are a very important part of this. And healthcare professionals and healthcare providers they can build their careers and their clinical services. Um, on uh, these issues. So if there's an apparent epidemic of ADHD or whatever, then those you know, academics working in that area, those providing clinical services, either as clinics or as individuals, um, can really benefit from um, that. Uh, now, they're not necessarily doing it in a cynical way, but there's a, there are opportunities there for healthcare professionals and that they can become part of the problem by exaggerating the issue. And I think some of the older allergists, I've heard them say, well, you know, I've, I've, I think I've been part of the problem. You know, I've stood up there banging the allergy drum saying, Allergy is so important and under-recognized and whoops, maybe I was overdoing it a bit and I didn't realize now looking, looking at the numbers now. And then patient groups, and, and unfortunately this, um, uh, patient groups are, you know, although they're there to protect patients, they sometimes, uh, because a patient group will be a patient group for a specific disease, a charity, they are quite often, they need to bang the drum, they need to attract funding themselves, and that can lead to exaggeration of the importance, the impact, uh, the prevalence of uh, the condition. And often you see a sort of alliance, really, between the, the pharma, uh, the prominent healthcare professionals in the field, and the patient groups. Um, and the, uh, those alliances need to be very, very carefully managed to ensure that they don't altogether drive uh, overdiagnosis and overtreatment uh, with associated harms. So I'm going to just give uh, an illustration of how that might work with um, uh, milk allergy as an example. And so um, what's been driving that? that that push of uh, specialized formula use in, in England. And I'd like to propose that um, uh, those same drivers are relevant in allergy as, as elsewhere. So the main um, sort of guideline that people use in primary care, so which influences their decision making around whether to use specialized formula milks, is the MAP guideline, Milk Allergy in Primary Care Guideline, which was published in uh, 2013. And this is the main algorithm uh, in that publication. And what they're really focusing on is this entity of mild, non-IG mediated milk allergy. So probably the most diffuse and sort of difficult to pin down entity within milk allergy <clears throat> and some controversy over its existence or, or, or prevalence. Um, and so, and what they suggest is that any one of these symptoms here um, may indicate uh, a milk allergy. If you look down the list of symptoms, and I think you're mostly pediatricians on the, on the call, um, you'll see that they really cover pretty much any baby. Um, remember, milk allergy affects about 1% of infants. We've got colic here, which affects about 20%. Food aversion, refusal issues, about 20%. That's 20% enough to go and see a healthcare practitioner about it. Loose or frequent stools, red bottom, abdominal discomfort, uh, rashes, coughs and colds. You know, really, there isn't a baby who doesn't have one of these symptoms. So this is, for me, a very obvious case of uh, a guideline which has um, you know, been disseminated by industry for very good reasons, because it promotes um, overdiagnosis and overuse of products. Um, um, and it's not alone. You know, the milk allergy field is, is dominated, really, by the industries that profit from it. And this is another very prominent uh, milk allergy guideline. They called it an awareness tool. 
um, and it's um, much more openly supported by the industry in that it's a, the Nestle Health Science is sort of producing all the materials. It's for parents and healthcare professionals. Um, and uh, again, if you look down there, there's all this, there's association between crying and milk allergy, which is, there's no epidemiology showing that, you know, there is no <laughs> epidemi epidemiology showing, you know, association between crying or screaming babies in the presence of milk allergy. Of course, some forms of allergy do cause abdominal pain, but um, um, so the, these sort of weak associations which are made there, and the stools are really interesting as pediatricians, they're using the Bristol stools chart to abnormalize infant stools. Um, and so the normal stools on the Bristol stool chart are um, type three or type four. So a sausage shape with cracks or a smooth soft sausage or snake. And um, anything else apart from that gets a score and makes your stools abnormal and means you might have milk allergy. And I don't know, we've had six kids and they were mostly type seven, I'd say, or type six. And, I, and that's certainly what I see in the nappies of my patients. Um, and I, I wouldn't call that abnormal as a pediatrician, but if you're following the, uh, you know, the Nestle supported tool, then, then normal infant, you know, variations and things that might be quite shocking to first time parents and quite surprising um, become labeled as, as possible milk allergy. Um, and I don't think it's a total coincidence that the, the UK guideline, the um, uh, MAP guideline, you know, just after its publication, there's this, this upswing in, in prescription of low allergy infant formula milk because that guideline was so widely disseminated by um, uh, the formula industry at symposia on websites etc. So that's a sort of brief illustration of how the, that, that, that overdiagnosis process can work and how I think it's happened with um, uh, milk allergy and of course that's great success for the industries and who can blame them for trying to sell more product and, um, and make more profit and um, you know the main harm of this particular process uh, one would think is uh, a cost to the NHS. So the, the CCG pharmacy budget's getting a bit tight and the, some of them have been making a bit of a noise about this, the, the you know, upswing in costs from specialized formula milks. It's time for our next question. Um, uh, is it safe to breastfeed infants who have milk allergy? So it's about 1% of infants who do have milk allergy. Um, is it uh, safe for a mother to um, breastfeed, just the normal way? Um, is it only safe if she's on a dairy-free diet? Um, uh, is it essentially best not to breastfeed because however much you try and avoid dairy, you, you're going to get some tiny explosion and, and that's going to make your baby unwell? Um, or do you have some uncertainty about this uh, particular question? <clears throat> okay, that's great. Thank you for polling so fast. And um, so I think your answers are really aligned with the guidelines. So these uh, industry disseminated or, or, or developed guidelines are um, really promote this idea that mother needs to be on a dairy-free diet. It's a very important part of what the guidelines are doing. And this is where I want to come to the sort of second harm, apart from the cost, of the milk allergy diagnosis. And I think this is where it becomes there's a sort of wider context around um, what's happening with milk allergy. Uh, um, uh, so. Um, as you said, uh, as you all responded, um, if you go to the guidelines, they will tell you um, uh, a breastfed infant with some of these symptoms, which may be milk allergy or not, um, that should have, you know, right at the top, they all say strict exclusion of cow's milk from mother's diet. Uh, and some of them say, well, look, if things are not getting better, exclude other foods or use a, a, a specialized formula milk, you know, because um, that, that's safer than breastfeeding. And I want to reflect on that uh, and on how we got there, um, because there are no clinical trials showing that's uh, you know, a useful thing to do. Um, so we have to use sort of lower level evidence, mechanistic reasoning or, or observations. Um, and um, so what I want to start with is that is because those, those studies where they recognize that you know, infants can react to their mother's milk and perhaps to mother's um, uh, food that she's eating, uh, affecting her milk, that's, that's um, there's been about 100 years of studies on that, and the, most of them were in the 1980s, where they, they, people identified using ELISA that you could find little bits of milk protein or egg protein or, or, or gliadin in breast milk. Um, and they go, wow, you can find you know, nanograms of this stuff in breast milk. And um, look, that might be causing symptoms in the babies. And certainly mothers uh, you know, report that their infants behave differently when they eat certain foods. Um, uh, but what we didn't know at that time was how much milk is required to trigger an allergic reaction in a child who's got milk allergy. And we know that now, you know, that's pretty clear. 
Um, and this is a typical study, and this shows that the average child with milk allergy uh, needs to drink uh, or needs to consume about 100 to 300 um, milligrams of uh, cow's milk protein, so about a teaspoon or so of cow's milk, uh, in order to trigger an allergic reaction. That's the average child with milk allergy. Um, and for non-IgE milk allergy, um, the sort of delayed type, uh, the thresholds tend to be much higher, and this is the sort of uh, t um, probably the, the best uh, characterized series from the uh, Isle of Wight showing uh, uh, that a small number of patients in a cohort of around a thousand infants had these sort of delayed responses to very large exposures to cow's milk, you know, they're needing 200 mils plus of cow's milk to trigger um, sort of milder symptoms. And I think this is what the guideline is talking about in terms of mild to moderate non IgE milk allergy. What does that mean um, in terms of the amount of milk protein in breast milk? Well, in general, um, if you've confined milk protein in, in breast milk, then it's around uh, one or two nanograms per mil. That's obviously a lot lower than in formula milk or in fresh milk, where you've got about 10 million uh, nanograms per mil of, of allergenic protein. And in fact, of, we've done a systematic review of this, and of all the studies ever published, the highest individual um, level reported in any sample from any woman you know, consuming enormous amounts of dairy or, or, or normal diet um, is uh, 800 uh, nanograms of beta lactocobium per mil. So that's the highest on the right there uh, level ever reported in any human being of a cow's milk uh, protein in the uh, in breast milk. And that's probably an aberration, uh, you know, a, a lab error, but we'll leave it in there. Um, most agree that one or two nanograms per mil is, is sort of what you get. How does that measure up? So how much breast milk would a milk allergic infant need to drink to trigger an acute allergic reaction? So if you do the maths, you know they need to drink 100 to 300 milligrams of um, milk protein. And here you've got nanograms of uh, beta-lactoglobulin, which represents about 10% of milk protein. Well, if you do the maths, uh, essentially the average infant with milk allergy needs to drink about 2,000 litres of uh, breast milk from a dairy consuming uh, mother in order to trigger an acute allergic reaction, which is clearly a, a, a unfeasible uh, event. Even if they breastfeed from the woman with the highest excretion of um, uh, uh, dairy protein in her breast milk ever reported, um, they need to drink about 20 litres. Um, and that's for infants with you know, obvious IgE mediated milk, uh, milk allergy. Um, the average infant with non-IG mediated milk allergy needs to drink, you know, absolute preposterous quantities. So this, what this does is just raises in my mind a question of whether those um, reports, when mothers report that their child's behavior is different when they eat a certain food or they're on a certain diet, is that really allergy? And I, I don't think we have any, any evidence to suggest that is. And I think there are probably other mechanisms going on when women's diets uh, uh, influence their children's behavior. And that raises the question, really, of what are we doing as healthcare professionals saying, you know, look, we know that you need to exclude this food from your diet. And what, those, what the milk allergy guidelines lead to is a sort of abnormalization of, um, uh, or medicalization of infant, um, uh, sort of what you might call normal physiological, but sometimes quite troublesome infant symptoms, vomiting, uh, crying, runny poos, rashes, etc. And if we label those things, which are largely not milk allergy, as milk allergy, and ask women to um, uh, exclude specific things from their diet, then it was sort of developing a process uh, where uh, you know, a woman with, uh, who's struggling with her child um, starts to feel that her milk is part of the problem and that her milk has reduced value for her infant because it's probably or possibly containing something which might be contributing to her infant symptoms. And unfortunately, I mean, the, the, given the history of the um, marketing of infant formula milk, um, this is I think likely to be exactly what the formula companies are after when they're investing so much money in promoting overdiagnosis of milk allergy because they've time and again you know, developed initiatives to try and undermine women's confidence in breastfeeding um, and make it seem difficult. And, um, uh, um, and uh, this would fit very well in the pattern of behavior in terms of um, uh, wanting to uh, make the main competitor for formula milk, breast milk, uh, seem to be problematic and then to provide a, a, a commercial solution for that. So I think that's where milk allergy overdiagnosis is coming from. It's promoting sales of specialist products, but it's also undermining um, women's uh, confidence in their own uh, milk and, and, and breastfeeding. Um, and if you sort of look at where we're getting our education and we've got these sort of 
you know, formula symposia everywhere, really. They used to be face-to-face, -face, now they're all webinars, um, where a lot of pediatricians are signed up and, and, and you know, working closely with the industries. Um, I think you have to question, you know, you, you all think it's very important to, um, uh, for a mother to restrict her diet. I, I wouldn't work against women who are restricting their diets, but I think the idea that we as healthcare professionals know that women should be excluding specific things from their diet and they're breastfeeding a child with some sort of symptoms, I, I think that's a bit of a fallacy. And, 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 and the reason it's so embedded in our culture is that a lot of our education is being influenced by um, industries who profit from that sort of advice. So I could go on and talk a little bit about what I think our practice should be in children with um, these sort of symptoms and, and proposed milk allergy. But I think I thought better to finish off really with um, uh, just putting this in the wider context of I think where it sits in terms of child health professionals and infant nutrition. And I particularly want to um, you know, look at the relationship between child health care professionals, our roles really, um, and uh, the former industry, because there's, there's a lot of history there and, it, and, it, and it's interesting. So I'm gonna give you about two or three slides just to paint the backdrop of how I think this milk allergy over diagnosis picture fits into the overall uh, relationship we have with, with former industry. And I've just realized that I'm absolutely run out of time, so I'm sorry if I've been speaking so slowly. So I'm gonna have to just leave you to look at these slides, I think, because we've only got four minutes left and no time for questions. So they are self-evident. I think uh, pediatricians, close relationship, advocates for cleaner food, purer food, safer feeding, but historians of breastfeeding will tell us that child healthcare professionals have played a major role in, this decline in um, uh, breastfeeding over the last century. And UNICEF and others will tell us that women are so, so vulnerable to misinformation from us and from the former industries. This is a woman who's breastfeeding twins, She's a girl and a boy. She's given the boy formula because um, she's favoring the boy. And then the boy's becoming unwell and she's continuing to formula feed them as they die while she breastfeeds her, her less important daughter. And I think that just reflects, you know, the mother is going completely against what is glaringly obviously happening in, under her eyes. She's going against her natural maternal instinct for breastfeed based on advice from healthcare professionals and or um, uh, marketing initiatives uh, from the foreign industry. So it's a factor of the fact that women and their infants really do protecting and, and we're in the best place to do that as child health care professionals. Bob, can yeah. I just cut it? Can I just cut in? We've got an hour if we need it. So don't feel you've got to hurry through your slides. Um, oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. I got it. Um, I was thinking we we're finishing at nine. We're finishing at 9.30. Okay. Unfortunately, you've got me in for longer. Um, <laughs> thank you, Andy. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll talk through this because I, I, I just, um, yeah, that's lovely. I, it won't take more than um, 10, 15 minutes, I think, to um, finish off here. So, yeah, just to paint, so that is because it's interesting, the history, really. Formula, formula milk was invented in the mid-19th century, um, you know, in response to um, industrial revolution and, and changing lifestyles and, and women not wanting to sit at home um, or, or to breastfeed their infants for, for prolonged periods of time. Um, but actually, even 100 years ago, unpasteurized cow's milk was the main alternative still being used. And pediatricians, you know, play, played a very important role in pushing for um, cleaner food for infants, um, uh, the pure food laws in, 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 in North America. And this is a sort of public health piece of advice. Um, and at the bottom, the key message, um, you know, you can't improve on God's plan um, for your baby's sake, nurse it. Mother's milk for mother's babe and cow's milk for calves. So the main message there being, you know, breastfeed, don't use these dangerous alternatives. And that, um, it, you know, pediatrician's sort of advocacy role um, became complicated by pediatricians also pushing for these things which we now know really undermine breastfeeding, like, um, uh, you know, scheduled four hourly feeds, uh, program separation of mother from infant, which, which was standard care right through to the mid 1970s um, in this country. Uh, um, and, um, Pediatricians also advocating, so as the sort of harms of even the pasteurized, you know, purified powdered milks became recognized, um, so um, scurvy, and so they add orange juice or, or, or um, rickets, and then they add cod liver oil and um, phosphate overload, um, uh, um, other nutritional deficits, you know, still being discovered now. Um, 
pediatricians increasingly, increasingly became advocates for formula A over formula B. You know, you must use the formula that's got added vitamin C or vitamin D in it because this is going to protect your baby from rickets. And you can see how that message can very subtly be spun to sound like eat, these new products are very exciting. They've got health advantages. They sound great and even perhaps more exciting than your breast milk. And that's really been the major um, sort of push from in marketing in terms of it um, has been you know, exaggerating the value of um, uh, formula milks and their special ingredients and, um, and downplaying the value of breast milk to so such an extent that, you know, mid last century, pediatric organizations were recommending in some cases formula feeding over breastfeeding because if you stuff enough protein into the formula milk, you can get short term high growth rates, um, uh, much like you do with uh, preterm formula now, um, uh, which makes it look like they're, they're better than breast milk. And so those close relationships between pediatricians as advocates for cleaner, better infant feeding um, have became twisted over time, really, um, and by the very profitable formula industries. You know, Nestle, which is one of the first formula companies, I mean, they're the biggest food company in the world. They produce a quarter of the food that the world eats. Um, you know, so they've become these enormous globalized industries, very powerful. And the pediatricians, you know, wanting to advocate for better child health become easily used, I would say, in these relationships. Um, and, um, you know, historians, as I said um, so briefly before, they, they, they see us, you know, and unfortunately, child care professionals, um, you know, largely male through the last century, um, and uh, as being, playing an important role in undermining the whole breastfeeding process. And it's really the mid 1970s, there's this wake up moment, and Tom Oppie at St. Mary's Hospital was played an important role here. Um, of discovering and rediscovering the value of breast milk and that it's you know it's actually got all sorts of things in there that we're never going to manage to make in, in, in formula milk and there's, there's no way that formula milk will ever be as you know health promoting as um as breast milk and so there's this little upswing uh, as people realize that, that the, the things are not equivalent um uh, but we haven't moved very far from there and our, our breastfeeding rates are quite similar now to what they were in the mid 1980s um and as i said i won't, I won't repeat myself but this um you know we're in a sort of unique position really where we see the patients we can influence individuals decision making just by the way we say things and the emphasis we put on different things and and that can have very powerful effects um which um you know surprisingly can really overcome mother's um natural instincts so that's why we've got this international code of marketing of breast milk substitutes advertising of formula milk is widely seen as a bad thing um unfortunately this 1981 code has no legal teeth and it's been variably implemented around the world and we've still got the same issues happening and who you know who say that around 800,000 infants uh, die per year because they're not breastfed uh, as per recommendations um uh, cite um limiting formula company marketing as the number one um uh, issue here so the number one barrier to promoting breastfeeding is the very sophisticated marketing uh, efforts of the of the globalized multinationals and that healthcare systems um, uh, are you know play a very important role in supporting women, and I think we need to reflect a little bit on what we're doing across the imperial trusts, uh, where we're not uh, uh, uniformly baby friendly by any means, um, uh, or you know UNICEF approved in that sense um, for supporting women. So I'm going to finish off with I've got three quick questions for you, um, just as a piece of reflection, really. So first one, um, another poll here: um, How long uh, does WHO recommend that infants should be breastfed for? So total. Uh, duration of breastfeeding um, for um, infants across the world has been recommended um, uh, by WHO. Um, countries make their own recommendations a little bit, but how long should a woman, woman breastfeed her infant for in, in total? Okay, I think that'll do. Thank you, thank you for um, for polling those who put their results there. So most people said at least six months, which is which is what most UK audiences say. We'll come to the results in a minute. I've got two other quick questions uh, for you. Um, if I can move it on. So our um, next question, uh, personal question: Have you ever attended an educational event supported by Formula Company? So this might be 
you know, Nutritia supplying a lunch at a pediatric grand rounds or, you know, Nestle symposium at a conference um, or any sort of education event where you've got former companies there, uh, you know, with stands, um, where they'll, which means they're usually providing money to support the event. Okay, that's great. That's plenty. Thank you very much for um, for that one. And then there's one more um, quick question before we sort of reflect on the answers. Um, so uh, if you're as a pediatrician or a child health professional, uh, you encounter a woman who's um, having difficulty getting her infant to latch on properly and, and establish breastfeeding, um, how confident do you feel in um, showing her how to um, attach her uh, uh, infants and, and help her infant get a better latch. Um, how much training have you had in this area? Are you very confident? You've been trained and you this is something you've um, shown women how to do. You've got practical experience. Um, is it something where you've had a bit of training but you're not not very practically experienced? Um, somewhere where you've got a bit of the theory but you don't really, not really too sure what to do or you've got no, no idea. Or, um, so thank you for putting your options in there. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you for sharing those, Nicholas. So, um, so mixed mixed picture there, um, depending on our experience. So, so what you've got there is most um, most people said um, breastfeeding should be for at least six months. Um, most people have attended a, a formula company uh, sponsored piece of education, um, and mixed picture really with with very few of us confident in supporting women to establish uh, uh, breastfeeding. Latching issues being the number one sort of um, uh, issue which needs uh, support uh, uh, for establishing breastfeeding. So um, the WHO guidelines, um, there's two years, at least two years, and um, I think it's, how long does it take you to read that? That's been the guideline for the last 30 years, it hasn't changed at all. Uh, it's about half of babies around the world are breastfed for at least two years. That's uh, been historic UK guidance as well. Um, uh, I just would like you to reflect. I think it takes 20 seconds to read that. Um, presumably, if none of us or a minority of us are aware of that, it's not in any formal paediatric teaching. I've given this talk with ex-presidents of RCPH there, and they didn't know the answer. So, so I think it just, it just wanted to reflect, really, the, the balance of education and information and training that we have as child healthcare professionals. If breastfeeding is important, um, you know, what are we doing? Um, we're getting lots of information from, from the companies that undermine breastfeeding as part of their job um, in their marketing departments. And we are not picking up the most basic, simple uh, child health advice, learning how to support women to initiate breastfeeding and advise them appropriately. Um, and, you know, that reflects partly where we are in the UK, but, you know, UK, Europe, North America, I mean, we're all, you know, the westernized countries are, you know, they have pretty low breastfeeding rates um, for, you know, largely historic reasons. Um, but UK is, you know, is right at the bottom of the pile at the moment, um, with a real minority of um, infants being nourished in the sort of normative uh, uh, human way. Um, uh, and I think just to, you know, to finish off this just is in the context of a burgeoning evidence base around the um, potential harms of associations with industry in terms of industry. You know, they have no role in education, in guideline development. I mean, that's just not their remit. Their remit is to develop and market products. And that marketing, you know, it needs to be limited in the context of pharma, and it needs to be uh, limited in the context of uh, infant formula industry particularly and infant formula industry are but you know they're much less well regulated than pharma and you know that's why they're they've particularly been singled out really by um bmj rcpca each others over the years this comes and goes but they really you know their their marketing activities um and their involvement of us in their marketing activities is very comfortable for child health professionals get nice lunches speaker fees you know a little bit more promotion and visibility um, but you're um, part of a process which is not supporting uh, child health. So just to conclude, um, unless all our epidemiology studies are wildly wrong, then milk allergy is clearly significantly overdiagnosed and overtreated, at least in this country. 
Um, and this is part of a wider picture of unhealthy relationships between child health professionals and formula companies. Um, a major culture change is required, and that's not easy, uh, in order to adequately protect infants from excessive use of formula products. And I think we need to start on our own patch and consider you know, how much priority are we giving uh, at Imperial to becoming baby friendly and to fully supporting the women and infants who, who come through our service. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say. Um, I'm going to put our allergy MSC plug slide in there. Um, if anyone's particularly interested in allergy training, we do lots of courses here. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and see if there's any, if there are any questions or um, comments about what we've talked about today. Um, okay, so I'm going to chat. So Bob, can I kick off? Andy Bush here, and you've properly put me to shame with your talk, with my scepticism that milk allergy would be at all interesting for, for such a long time. You raise a very important question, much wider than breast milk, and that is industry relationships in terms of guidelines. Uh, you may recall, and I'm sure others do, that the statin guidelines that recommended that everybody should take statins more or less as soon as the umbilical cord is cut to prevent disease were written by people, all of whom were taking money from, money from the statin industry. And there are others like, like, asthma, like asthma guidelines where, uh, uh, interesting, I've just co-chaired the severe asthma guidelines for the ATS and the ERS. And the reason I the reason I got asked to co-chair was I think I was only one of only two asthma doctors on the planet who weren't taking money from the pharma industry. And I think in terms of writing of write, writing guidelines and dissemin disseminating guidelines, they can be very powerful in the right way and the wrong way. And I think all of us behoves all of us to look very carefully at conflict of interest statements and any guideline that we're looking just to see. You know who's taking who's taking whose money. Of course, there are many, and I'm sure you'd agree, there are many excellent guidelines that are impartial and are very useful in practice. But the word guideline covers a multitude of sins. Yeah, I think I, I mean I agree on the, the milk allergy guidelines. Um, uh, eighty percent of authors have a conflict of interest with the companies, and, and as you've seen, the companies you know, pay for the guideline process. And I didn't put up all the details, but in some of the guidelines they are very clearly the, you know they say they they say the, the the algorithm was developed by kappa consulting you know a, a marketing consultancy firm uh funded by a um you know industry so the sort of guidelines i mean as, you know i think the former industry are, are rather extreme compared to pharma but as you say the, the you know pharma are very involved in many guidelines i think i'm I, i'm a bit more cynical about it Yoni. i think it's a minority of guidelines really that are Free from these sort of conflicts. Um, I mean, Nice make quite stringent efforts to, um, you know, push some of those conflicts uh, away. But I think most specialty organisations are heavily dependent on pharma funding, and and a, a lot of guidelines are produced by specialty organisations. Um, so I think they struggle. I think they really struggle with these issues and the and the, and the subtle sort of framing uh, of things. I always wonder. I mean, I'm not an asthma specialist, Andy, but I always think that the sort of term asthma control, which is 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 a sort of example of you know it's talking about asthma control rather than severity of asthma it gives the whole impression that all asthma symptoms can be can be treated and and it's all um you know that drugs are, are are going to fix everybody um as an example i think there are subtle framing um uh, biases that, that creep into all sorts of uh in sorts of ways in, in guidelines not not just the simple recommendations um uh, which influence the way we speak about um symptoms and, and, and diseases and treatments. Well, do, do you have access to the chat? Because Claudine's just put up a board put up a question. Do you have access? Yeah, yeah, very good. Well thanks Claudine. I think that's so you're quite right. So the most obvious um, harm on the milk allergy guidelines is cost and there's a fourfold increase in cost of the last 10 years uh, to uh, the NHS from these uh, prescriptions. Um, and, you know, so that's, that's that's real and valid and that's impacting tax credits, it's impacting our ability to is NHS funds for everybody uh, um, But I think, and perhaps I didn't make myself clear enough, but I think the very important uh, harm is um, uh, undermining women's confidence in breast milk. So I think from a, um, what the, these guidelines are doing is they're telling women that you're because of your eating, and that means that your milk 
in harming your baby. And uh, we've got a commercial solution for that, which is uh, near Kate or whatever. So I think um, it's uh, it's okay that the former companies can sort of get at women and make them feel uncomfortable about their breastfeeding and their breast milk uh, without um, necessarily being that visible. Um, you know, so that, that that would be so. Those are the two two harms: the cost and and the influence on women's um, uh, uh, willing, you know, desire and um, willingness to continue breastfeeding for their baby. There's another one on the chat line, Bob. There are a couple, in fact. Um, should we stop advising mother to go dairy free if child has milk allergy? Yeah, thanks, Doga. I mean, I, I think if we've got time, I'm very happy to put a couple of slides up, up about what I think we should do. Um, because okay, I, okay, I think we've got, we've, we've got 15 minutes. So yeah. Okay. Look, if you want to do that, I can just I'll just uh, reshare and um, put up my opinion because I think it's a uh, these are like well, it's not milk allergy, but the sort of um, milk allergy as defined by the guidelines is something which we all are encountered by quite a lot. So in my view, there are three scenarios really. There's a breastfed infant who's got symptoms of crying, vomiting, or eczema. <clears throat> and I think we need to reflect, you know, these are all very common, much more common than milk allergy, and actually crying and vomiting have no epidemiological relationship with uh, uh, cow's milk allergy as far as we can tell from the studies. Eczema is associated with food allergy, so sometimes um, children with eczema have food allergy, um, but in general, uh, food allergy is not the main cause of eczema, it's more the other way around that eczema leads to food allergy developing. So breastfed infant with these symptoms, which the guidelines will tell you, oh, and the mother will say, oh, I've read the guidelines and I'm worried about milk allergy. What should you do? Um, you, you know, recognize there's no proven role for maternal dietary exclusions or, or specialist formula milk in this scenario. But I think you need to support women. And if women have already undertaken dietary exclusions and they feel they make a difference, um, then support them in that. I think I found I think important messages um, for women in this situation are that if they if they drink a glass of cow's milk, then in their breast milk there's a one in a million dilution. Okay, there's, there, there are nanograms of um, uh, uh, protein, so they're, they're not they're not going to give their baby any significant amount of milk. Um, by drink, by eating a bit of cake, um, and so I think they can, if they want to exclude milk or other foods, then they can do that. But you need to sort of support them in, in terms of trying to ensure that they don't put themselves through hell and uh, want to stop breastfeeding just because of the diet, which seems inappropriate, or or come to nutritional issues themselves, which some women do when they go on multiple exclusions. Um, so I think in your conversation with women, there needs to be a recognition that um, you know there's no you know, science doesn't tell us that, you know, women changing their diet is going to, excluding this or excluding that is going to change their infant's um, symptoms, but they may well have already have a fixed idea or their own experience of, you know, I ate chocolate and my baby cried. And, and so there's no reason to push against that. I think well, a woman's experience is the best evidence you've got there, essentially. Um, and I would manage um, vomiting, crying in the usual way. So, you know, Physiological reflux, as you know, it normally gets better by by six months or so. Um, positioning, reassurance um, for crying, for colic, you know, exclude um, the red flag issues. Okay, the typical none of this is mentioned in the milk allergy guidelines. They're clear over diagnosis promotion in the milk allergy guidelines. The stuff you need to, you know, what about bile stain vomiting, developmental delay, growth failure, you know, erythroderma. Um, um, blood in the stools, what about these? Now blood in the stools is an interesting one because a lot of babies get a little bit of blood in the stools and that's quite a common reason why people start to put mums on, on, on exclusion diets. So I think you need to have common sense around that and look at well, is the, how much harm is the baby coming to? How much blood is there? Have other issues been excluded? Um, is there any evidence? You know, is, it, is the mum's experience telling you that um, uh, changing her diet uh, influences the infant symptoms. So this would be my simple approach really, mainly managing crying and vomiting eczema in the usual way, um, and but supporting women in any dietary choices they've made, uh, trying to make sure that they have adequate intake. And that's uh, that, this is the scenario I think where you've got the most potential to cause harm. If you start jumping up and down and saying, oh, you must exclude this, or do consider doing that, or oh, there might be something wrong with your diet or your milk, and you must, and if you're going to exclude cow's milk, oh, be extra careful, you don't touch anything that's been baked, you know, near a, near a baked biscuit crumb or something, because, you know, you're, you're really, I think you're doing what the formula companies want you to do, um, and you're not uh, serving the best interests of that woman or child if you, if you start to sort of actively 
promote the idea of dietary exclusions in that scenario. Um, second situation, which is the usual situation um, for uh, cow's milk allergy, this is how most cow's milk allergy presents, is um, you know, a breastfed infant, but someone's given them a cow's milk product, either yogurt or formula milk or something, and they've had uh, uh, an allergic reaction. Um, this is often the first or second or third time they're given something with cow's milk in it, sometimes a powdered baby milk. And this is often cow's milk allergy. Um, again, um, so what the guidelines will tell you, they'll focus very much on specialized formula milk and they'll focus on maternal dietary restriction, restrictions. But again, you need to emphasize there's no proven role for maternal dietary exclusions. And in this scenario, women are not usually excluding things from their diet and they don't usually see that that would be necessary. The initiative comes from you, and I don't think that's helpful. Um, these are children who probably got milk allergy, and we've already seen from my slides before that the amount of milk that gets through mothers, you know, when mothers on a dairy diet, is not gonna, is very unlikely to harm their infant. However, if the child's got a definite milk allergy, her mother might not want to be, you know, drinking milk while she breastfeeds her baby because if she spills some, the baby might get a rash. You know, there's a contamination issue. So if you've got a milk allergy, you want to avoid cow's milk. And if you're an infant, breastfed infant and you're you know, close to your mother, then um, uh, you know, mother drinking milk is, is not that helpful. Eczema is often present. And then there's a, this issue of well, management of eczema. Um, uh, if women wish to try dietary exclusions, it's the same thing. I think you just need to support them if that's, that's their choice. I don't think we can tell them what to exclude or how, how long to exclude it for. We just need to ensure they don't you know, go over the top. Um, and as I say, they may wish to avoid cow's milk to reduce accidental exposure. And, you know, in my view, having an infant with milk allergy is a good reason to continue breastfeeding. So I think you need to explore the reasons, if this was formula milk, why formula milk was introduced. Is there some misconception, some social issue which could, you know, be got around um, so they don't need to, you know, stop breastfeeding or initiate formula feeding? Because the alternatives to breast milk are not great, you know. Um, and when you've got... Um, um, a kid with milk allergy, they're worse. You know, you've got these disgusting specialized formulas who have, you know, they have nutritional risks associated with them um, compared to breast milk. Um, and uh, they can be very difficult to take, you know, they taste absolutely disgusting um, and they influence child's um, uh, taste development through life. So I think you just want to, you know, I think having a child with milk allergy is a good reason to, in this scenario, to sort of explore um, reasons why the mother's thinking of stopping breastfeeding or initiating, you know, has she got some women often, I mean, a common reason in this scenario is women think that, well, like, giving a little bit of middle formula milk is going to make the baby less hungry, maybe make them sleep better or something. So you're going to explore in a, you know, good general pediatric way, um, uh, other ways of addressing the sleep issue or the hungry baby issue uh, without um, initiating formula milk, because that doesn't, you know, it's, um, that may cause more problems than it, than it, than it adds in. Um, uh, and then the third scenario really is the formula fed infant. So receiving quite a bit of formula milk who has troublesome symptoms. And these kids will often have been formula fed from quite early on and they may have, you know, severe vomiting, diarrhea, crying, eczema, et cetera. So again, um, you need to manage these in the, in the usual way. So um, for a formula fed infant with severe vomiting, then, then thickened uh, feeds can be effective, um, uh, but they can uh, cause constipation as well. Um, crying, eczema, same thing, usual management, skin creams for eczema, um, reassurance for crying, and then exclusion of, you know, strangulated hernia or, you know, uh, or et cetera, by looking for red flag symptoms, bar stain, vomiting, growth failure, developmental delay, et cetera. Um, but I think in this scenario, it is slightly different. I think this scenario, if you're, you know, the kid is receiving a, sh a lot of cow's milk protein, very, very, very high dose of cow's milk protein. So even if they've got a very, 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 very mild <laughs> milk allergy, um, you know, that will, the symptoms will manifest. And so if they've got really difficult symptoms, um, troublesome symptoms that don't seem to be settling in the normal way, I think you'd have a relatively low threshold in this scenario for trying a specialist formula milk uh, for a couple of weeks to see if it makes any difference. Um, especially if symptoms started soon after initiating formula milk, or if they're unusually severe, or if the infant is, uh, seems to have some sort of enteropathy failing to thrive. So those um, three slides will be my um, take home messages in terms of uh, what you should do in this situation, rather than follow the guidelines, which will tell you that you know, all infants in this situation should have specialist formula milk, uh, all infants in this situation should have 
specialist formula milk and the mother's gone on, on funny diets and uh, and all infants in this situation should also mothers go on special diets and consider specialist formula milk. So I hope that's clear enough, but happy to answer another question about it, Durga, if that's not clear. That's my question at the bottom, um, if I can ask it um, in the chat. So I'm a speech therapist and also I'm a lactation consultant. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for uh, your presentation or your work in this area. Um, but my question is, I, I have occasionally supported mums where there's been this family history of atopy, baby's got early onset, quite severe eczema, GI symptoms. And when they've excluded, the, the symptoms have resolved the infant symptoms, particularly the skin ones and the GI. So I wondered if you thought there was maybe an accumulative impact of um, you know, for infants who have multiple food allergies that can come through via the breast milk that might account for the resolution or whether you've got any hypothesis about other mechanisms that go on in the incidences where there is an outcome from exclusion. Thanks, Stacey. I mean, you know, the issue is that these symptoms tend to improve quite rapidly a lot of you know the crying and um and gi symptoms which are particularly promoted by the, the the companies in these guidelines um you know they naturally improve over time so and it and and you know once a woman has excluded something and felt that it's helped and and the symptoms have got better i mean i had a woman the other day she showed me a you know two and a half year old child said oh my my um you know i wanted to review my, my child's um, milk and install he's still on nick and I said, okay, so how did that start? And she gave me a photo of rash taken to her, her doctor when the child was a few weeks old. Um, and there was some um, uh, erythema toxicum there. No, no, seborrhea it was, seborrhea. And she'd been to the GP and the GP said, oh, that's milk allergy, you must go on Neocate. So since the child is four weeks old, he's been on Neocate uh, for seborrhea, which has absolutely no connection with allergy at all. And the mother's got a completely fixed idea that the seborrhea resolved because of the change in diet. And, you know, you're going to see that and you're going to see that in your patients you're going to believe it they're going to believe it you've got a shared ignorance there um i think you know but i'm not going to i mean if a mother changes her diet and something improves who who, who are we to, to go against that i just don't think we should be actively promoting this concept i don't think it's helpful um uh in especially for breastfeeding women i um, think with hindsight that mother actually went on to get skin prick testing and he was he was ige to multiple allergies yeah, he would do he would do so with eczema you would do so eczema is associated with food allergies but that doesn't mean the food allergy is the main cause of the eczema uh, in fact it's it's not doesn't it? i mean the, 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 the eczema leads to the onset of food allergies as far as we understand it um so i um but, the, but thanks for that and, and maria you've asked how frequent is ige mediated cosmic allergy in babies one percent uh of babies and it um uh, it usually presents acutely, uh, like that second slide I showed with uh, acute symptoms after first or second um, uh, time they have um, cow's milk off in their first formula or yogurt or, or some baby food with milk in it. Um, yeah. Okay, so I think we've, and we've got a couple of minutes if there's any other question. Yeah. But I mean, I think, Stacey, you've raised a very important point that, and, and this is a beautiful, beautiful place for the formula companies to market in because there's so much vagueness there. And, uh, and once someone has even put, planted the idea in a woman's mind that her milk, her milk might be a problem or her diet might be a problem, it's very, very hard to, you don't, I mean, there's no point in trying to push back from that. Um, once the idea is there, you know, it doesn't matter how unlikely it is, you just want to do the best for your baby and you really don't want to be harming them every time you feed them. So it's a very sort of powerful, um, uh, um, it's a very powerful sort of uh, tool, a marketing tool, from, I think, from the, from the former company's point of view. And, and it, it's a difficult one for us to, to wind back from. All right. Thank you, everybody. It sounds like we're, we're, we're all done. Thanks so much for tuning in with the uh, boring title of Cows and <laughs> A huge thanks to you, Bob. We really appreciate it. So on behalf of everyone, um, thanks for your time and your expertise this morning. And just a reminder to everyone else, we're back next week with Aubrey Cunnington on musculoskeletal infections. And the link for Bob's talk um, today will go live this afternoon on the usual Google Drive link, um, which we have circulated, but you can also access through your postgraduate and pediatric directorate teams, or you can be in touch with me directly and we'll make sure that you have it. But um, once again, just thanks very much to Bob on behalf of all of us um, for this morning. Thank you.